From the Tiger Cats Audio Network, this is Tiger Cats Game Day with Courtney Stephen and Mike Daly. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Tiger Cats Game Day on the Tiger Cats Audio Network. It is preseason week two, and the Hamilton Tiger Cats are in Montreal. And you know, as usual, I am Courtney Steve. I'm here with my main man, Mike Daly. And Mike, whenever they travel to Montreal, it's a great game. But this one's just in and out for the preseason. There's a lot at stake, but it depends who you are. It's not really going in the win column and the loss column. This one is specifically and solely to earn a spot on the roster for the 2023 campaign. How are the coaches, how are the players feeling about this game? Yeah, and I mean, you can see it by the depth chart, right? You look at the depth chart for tonight, and it's just, it's all a bunch of backups and guys that probably won't be suiting up for the starters in week one, right? So this is an evaluation completely. These guys going out here are are looking to make a name for themselves, to make the squad. And like we said last week, it's it's also a resume builder for around the CFL, right? So what you're going to see is a bunch of people playing really hard, trying to stay within the defense or the offense or the special team that's there. but also make a name for themselves and and get their number flashing across the jersey or across the TV screen every once in a while and, uh, you know, trying to get their name out there in the CFL world. Yeah, and I think in the first week of uh, the Ticats preseason ventures, we did see a couple flashes of, of brilliance. We saw the lightning-like returner, uh, Lawrence Woods III. He had some thunder with a big hit. Early in the game, he also made an interception, so he was making a name for himself in somewhere where we weren't exactly used to seeing him. And and then there was other folks all across the board, whether it was in the in the return game or defense on offense. So I think they're going to be looking to continue on that. But just quickly looking back on the first game, who were some of the folks that really popped for you? Well, you said it right right off the bat was Lawrence Woods. Lawrence Woods the third. He. You get out there at that field corner spot where you know it's it's lonely out there sometimes. And if you're not used to how wide the CFL field is, right? And I know this is second year, but he was mainly on returner duty last year. Um, it, it's a lot of field to cover, and he looked fantastic. So now the question is, with Gallimore doing so well as a returner last game, is the focus for Lawrence Woods more on that back end in the DB core, or does he get double duty like, hey, you did – really well at field the corner but guess what you still got to return so i hope you're in shape <laughs> <laughs> and in shape i hope he is you know he's a guy who he makes a living running so if there's anything he could do it better be to uh get out there and sprint as fast as you can but I, i've got a lot of confidence and especially in the uh the valdosta state alumnus um leandre gallimore he's he's got a burst and I think that's something that he put on display with a few great efforts, you know, of course the touchdown that he punched in there. Um, but then a couple of other guys in that receiving core that I'm looking forward to watching. And I think we'll dive into that. Uh, Richie Sindani, he scored a touchdown. I thought he showed his uh, consistency in the relationship that he had with Bo Levi transferring over. And it was a very small sample size, but it looked great. That's exactly what we want is somebody who's going to be reliable And we talk about second down conversions. We talk about moving the ball in clutch situations. We talk about getting it in when you're at the high red zone. And he did all of those things. He caught the ball, he scored and made it look routine. And I think that's what you want. It's of course the big plays, but of course, on top of that, it's the guys who just make the plays that are needed at the time when they are needed, whether they have bells and whistles and fireworks, or if it's just, you know, getting those seven yards in a situation where you need seven yards. I think Richie Sindani uh, made a case for himself there. We're going to see more of O.C. Kusi, uh, Keandre Smith moving into the slot. We're going to see Terry Godwin and Bayless rounding out the rest of the receivers. We will not see um, McGriff, Justin McGriff, because he is going to be out for the season A lot was spoken about him leading up to the first preseason game and just throughout camp, a lot of mention of how he had been shining, uh, making a name for himself. But what what does that do for the team or how does that affect guys going into? I know this is a preseason game. We haven't even started the year yet. So it's all in theory or just hopeful of what we could have seen. But how does an injury like that to somebody who is really a focal point of a lot of the analysis, how does that change things? 
Yeah, I mean, initially, internally of the team, it's, you know, it's a it's a blow, right? Everybody's probably pretty down about it, right? Probably a shock to everybody. And the problem with that is because, you know, his name kept getting talked about, whether it was each day in camp or even in that last preseason game. He was making a ton of plays. Um, so to internally for the team and, and the players around him and his teammates, like, I, I'm sure it's a blow to them, but. The good thing for the Thai Cats, the positive lining on this is that it's still the preseason, right? So there's still trials to be had. There's still plays to be made by some guys that are looking to step up into McGriff's spot, right? So really what that does is it just opens up another opportunity for one of these guys playing in this game to be able to step in there and and make a case for themselves. But yeah, with the with the expectations that were surrounding McGriff and how he looked in that first game and how he's looked in, in training camp, this is a blow, especially for, you know, a guy like Tommy Condell, who was starting to drop a couple of plays, I'm sure for week one for him. Um, yeah. It, it's, it sucks for McGriff for sure, but I'm, I'm interested to see who steps up into that spot. Absolutely. And and Duke Williams, Tim White, neither of whom will be playing, but we can expect to see them in the regular season. David Beard, Joel Figueroa, other two anchors of that offensive line, those guys will not be suiting up today either. So a little bit of rest for those who have earned their spot and have proven that they still got what it takes and, and giving some space for the guys who are a little bit closer to being on that line or on that bubble or just trying to find where they fit in that depth chart, even if they are already established as folks will be on that team for this 2023 journey. Now, mm-hmm. look, hopping over to the other side of the ball, there's going to be some some names sitting out today. Uh, Ted Laurent not playing. He's he's well over 100 games of experience. So I don't know if an extra preseason game is really going to move the needle for him. Um, Jagarid, Simone, Jameer Thurman, Malik Carney, all key contributors. These guys are not who we're not going to see, but that doesn't mean that we're not going <laughs> to see great football because I, I think especially on defense, because the play doesn't have to be designed for you to have an impact. That's where we can see a lot of these folks who maybe haven't been in the headlines or haven't had a chance to build a huge reputation for themselves. I think that's where you're going to find out who are the next up and coming stars of this league and who are going to be the guys who are going to see contributing, you know, on third downs, on, on special teams, on punt, on punt return, on kickoff, kickoff return. Do you remember anything in particular about preseason and how you were approaching it as a defensive player? Were, were you thinking about special teams? Were you thinking about taking reps at different positions than your natural position? How are you approaching the game and how do you, as a player, try to stand out? Yeah, Court, I'm glad you asked that because preseason games for me were an absolute grind. All right. Mm. So for the years, <laughs> let me let me give you a little insight into what it looks like as, you know, maybe a, a second string or, or mainly special teams guy. Preseason games means that all the starters we just mentioned that are sitting out, well, guess what? Now you're starting, right? So all these guys that you're seeing suiting up for Montreal, they're starting. But that doesn't mean that they get any breaks on special teams because what also is going on during this is Jeff Reinbold and that special teams unit are evaluating who's going to line up and suit up for them in special teams for week one. So what that means is that, yes, hey, congratulations, you're starting this game. You get an opportunity to go out there and make some plays and – I was prepping for that, and as I'm sure all these guys are, to go make some plays on defense or offense. But also, week one, you're going to be playing on special teams for us, so you don't get any breaks on there. So a typical rep count for somebody playing in a game on defense or offense is about 60 plays. Well, at the end of the preseason games, you probably have about almost 100 plays under your belt. So Mm -hmm. you uh, you have no time to think, no time to get a breath, no time to uh, get a drink of water. You're just play after play after play. So it's exciting, though, because it gets these guys a ton of film, gets them a ton of experience, especially the ones that haven't played in the CFL yet or looking to contribute for the Ticats. That's what you're going to be looking at for this Montreal game. Yeah, and so I think just for the fans and listeners – giving them a little bit more of an insight into exactly what Jeff Reinbold is looking for in the folks who are going to be making up that special teams unit. I think it makes sense to go to the punt team and the punt return team. They're integral. It's one third of the game. You're going to have eight to 12 punts, eight to 12 punt returns per game in general. And those are going to be a lot of 
running back, linebacker, DB, potentially some receiver body types. What kind of skill sets are required to make the team and contribute at a high level if you're going to be playing on punt, punt return units, those which are some of the more core and more frequent on the field special teams? Yeah, the first one is hustle and effort. That's absolutely key is to see who's out there running as hard as they can, playing as hard as they can. Because, for I mean, you've, you and I have been around long enough to know that not everyone's like that, right? Mm-hmm. And it's hard to find someone that's going to go – all out every single play for the entire game. So that's that's first and foremost. And then number two is just being able to dominate your one-on-one matchups. Whoever it is across from you being able to win those matchups consistently because all uh, we've shown it, the Ticats have shown it time and time again with these returners. doesn't matter who's back there. You just got to win a couple matchups in those special teams, units, especially on punt return or kickoff return. And Lawrence was the third is going to find the end zone, right? So that's exactly what a guy like Jeff Reinbolt's looking for. Um, but the thing that I'm most excited about, especially in this game, is that the whole defensive back crew court looks like it's the starters and they are rolling out there as the starting group. So that's good to see for the Ticat fans because it's a lot of communication back there. We've talked about this. This is one of the hardest positions as a defensive back and bias. Yes, there is some bias in this group between me and you. But it's the hardest position to get communication-wise and get used to playing with everybody. So what are you trying to see from what looks like this starting group of the Ticat secondary in this game? Well, exactly like you mentioned, it's the communication and it's the lack of explosives from the opposing offense. You're going to have a guy out there who's on the other team trying to make a name for himself. And, you know, it could be the consistent throws that they want to make or it could be that big, huge play, that home run that catches the coach's eye in their favor if you're thinking of the opponent's offense. So on the Ticats side, for those defensive backs, keeping the roof on everything, keeping a lid on it, and making sure that the opponent can only get chunks at a time and not one humongous bite out of that defense, no explosive plays, and explosive play is a pass that is over 20 yards. You don't want to see them gouging you. And that generally happens when somebody either slips and falls down or blows coverage by taking the wrong person or running the wrong assignment, in, like taking the wrong zone, thinking somebody was behind them when they're not, thinking they have a double team when they don't and losing leverage. So those things all come down to communication. And I think a big reason why the Ticats don't usually give up a lot of those is because a free safety Tunde Adelike does a great job of communicating across the board. So from corner to corner, everybody is on the same page. And and that communication gives each player a, a level of confidence to do their own job without worrying about the person next to them. And so you don't do one and a half jobs, which usually ends up in you doing less than your full potential on your own job it's just a trust thing it starts with communication it starts at the back with that free safety and I think having Tunde out there with those guys who he will be spending a lot of time with this year is going to give them a chance to to get out of the gate with some sound communication prove it to themselves we know what we're doing we got each other's back and we can trust each other without looking over our shoulders yeah and and another thing that I'm looking forward to court especially in this game and I know I know how the fans are feeling about this game and how preseason. I'm sure that most of the players are too. It's okay. Let's just get to week one. Let's get to the games that matter. That, But what's really key in this game is Matthew Schiltz getting in there and getting these reps. I know we talked about this last game, and Matthew Schiltz ended up getting no many reps or no reps at all in that first game, right? And it was Bo Levi Mitchell in there. And then it was Powell taking the majority of that game, right? So this game in Montreal – Matt Schilt's getting in there because we've talked about it. A team needs two quarterbacks to be able to get in there because if something bad happens, like we saw last season, somebody needs to step in there like Matt Schilt's did. So these are huge reps to work with some of these young receivers to get them, you know, their name on the board and and get their name out there. So I'm I'm looking forward to Matt Schilt's getting some quality reps in this game. And I think it's going to be really key for the Ticats. Yeah, I like Matt Schilt's game, and I think for him, being a guy who doesn't always get in in the regular season, sometimes he does, but then it might be gadget plays. It might be uh, a drive here or there. This is really good for his own confidence, a chance for him to prove it to himself that he knows what he knows and that all the preparation and study that he's been putting in years over years is going to pay off, and it has been paying off. 
And when you have that kind of confidence in yourself, that's contagious so that when he enters the huddle, it's a different, a different tone when he talks to the receivers and he says, listen, guys, it's time for us to go make that play. I, I feel like whenever the new quarterback enters the huddle, they got to come with that attitude like, all right, are you guys ready to have fun or what? You know, so I think that develops in games like this where you have a chance to go sling it. Really, nothing's at stake except your job. So, I mean, that could be the biggest thing. But when you have the confidence, when you're prepared, you have the freedom to play at your highest level. And I think it, I'm excited to see what Matt Schultz does with that. Um, taking it a little bit more abstract, coming out of this game, now you're heading into Winnipeg for week one. Do you think that obviously the coaches have to have kind of one eye on Montreal tonight and then another eye on Winnipeg? Or is this, I'm completely focused on building this team right now, no time to game plan for the future. If you were a coach, how are you approaching that conundrum of, yeah, we got one right now, but very shortly thereafter, we've got another one and that one means a lot more. Yeah, Corey, I'm glad you asked that question because not being a player anymore and also not being a coach, I get to answer this thing honestly, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you, just... so you're not you're not pulling one out the can for this? <laughs> no, so this is – the political answer is we're looking at this game and this game only and we are evaluating players, which I believe they are. This is for an evaluation. But everything offensive, defensively in this game, especially even special teams as well, is going to be as plain as can be. Right. Let these guys go out there, let them play in a, a base offense, base defense, base special teams, and let's see what they can do. I can guarantee that there has already been Winnipeg film on after this first preseason game and before the first preseason game, and they've already started game planning. They're trying to figure out who's going to be in that game plan, right, and what they can do, but there's a good idea already. So the coaches will always say, yes, we are focusing on this game. We are focusing on playing Tiger Cat football against the Montreal Alouettes. But I can promise you that Tommy Condell, Mark Washington, Jeff Reinbolt's scouting report for Winnipeg Week 1 is already filled out and complete because they've watched all the film they need to. They know what's going on. And, Corey, you know that's exactly how it is, right, because they've been prepared for that Week 1, the ones that matter. This one is about seeing who can make plays. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, there's only so much that an offense can change from one year to the next. If it's going to make any monumental changes, it would be during training camp. But you are who you were before you even got here. And so the, the same Winnipeg concepts and schemes and I think just philosophy that they been using for the last few years is what you can expect to see come week one. The same stars will be the stars. The same signature plays will be the same signature plays. And so I could imagine that those scout cards have already been long drawn up <laughs> and they'll just be looking for, they're not going to give away any wrinkles in the preseason. They're no. not, they're not showing the the ingredients of the recipe in the preseason. So whatever you're going to be studying for week one is already out there in the ether. And, and I, I guarantee, I agree. They're already looking at it. Right. And then, like we said, this game is for someone to make a name for themselves in the very base offense, defense and special teams. And people will people will flash and, and those guys will be on the team. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. They're they're prepping for Winnipeg each one, which is good. Right. Which matters. Those are the games that matter. That's that first step to the great cup. So question for you before we wrap this up. Uh, who are the who is the person you're going to put the ISO cam on for this game? Is there an individual who you're interested to look for, or is there a position that you're looking at to just see what they have, or uh, you know, just looking specifically, or is it just you sit back and watch and wait to see something flash across your screen? How are you looking at this one? Or if somebody's watching, what should they look out for? Yeah, the first one I, I'm looking for is that first round draft pick of this year, Dayton Black. He's going to get in there at guard behind – he's lined up behind Brandon Revenberg. And if I know anything about the Thai Cats and how much they – how much weight they put into Brandon Revenberg, he's going to be out pretty quick in this game, right, mm -hmm. which gives Dayton Black that high pick rookie in that first round some real live bullets to get out there and have a full – almost a full game for himself. So I'm looking forward to that because that will just solidify the depth of that offensive line. Um, and then second, I do want to see how that secondary really gels together. Yeah, there will only be, you know, a few plays that they're all in there together. 
but especially that weak side corner battle, right? Between George Jr. and Sunderland. I think those are the two those are the two guys that are really gonna make this secondary be what it's gonna be, right? Like we had talked about before, this weak side corner spot is such a key spot when you get into those ISO situations, the one versus one, you're by yourself out there trying to stop that receiver from making the catch. This is key. So I'm going to keep my eye on that battle for sure. How about yourself? You know, I'm looking at Terry Godwin to see what he does. A guy who's been here, uh, he's had small opportunities to contribute, but I think he has a lot of quality skills that he brings to the table. Uh, a smaller guy relative to some of the bigger bodies that they have brought in this year. But I think there's a reason why the Tyke has had a number of receivers in that kind of build that Godwin has over the years. They, they he runs great routes. He's, he's reliable. He just really hasn't had a huge opportunity to show his stuff. And so with this, uh, what I expect to be extended opportunity for him to shine, I want to see what he does with it. And I think that he will take it and run with it. He's, He's got a lot of things to show this CFL world, and I think tonight could be the opportunity, 7.30 p.m. at Percival Molson, when the Hamilton Tiger Cats kick it off against the Montreal Alouettes. And of course, if you're not in Quebec, you can tune in at listen.tiecats.ca and get the whole game live from RJ and Luke, as always. But until next time, I hope that you keep paying attention because we are going to be paying attention and getting ready. We're watching our film. We're we're getting our scout cards ready for next week <laughs> against Winnipeg, where we will give you the game day information on Tiger Cast game day right here. All right. So stay tuned, subscribe, check us out on YouTube. And until next time, have a great game day. It's game day and you're ready. So are we. Let us know your thoughts. Email us at gameday at ticats.ca. Courtney Steven and Mike Daly are here every game day with their insights into today's game. Subscribe to the Ticats Audio Network on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.